Documenting Say's Court The 1653 manuscript plan of Say's Court is not only the most familiar image of the garden, but probably the most familiar item in the very rich Evelyn archive. In many ways it is the ideal document, large enough in scale to show all the areas of the garden and even individual rooms in the ground plan of the house, securely datable and with a long descriptive key. With the aid of this plan, one can virtually walk through the house and garden as they were when first conceived and created by Evelyn, into the front courtyard with its fair gravel walks planted with cypress and the walls with fruit, up to the front porch, flanked by two Doric columns, and over it my wife's closet of collections, through the door with its arch towards the hall, discovering the large and fair staircase up to the full height of the roof, into the withdrawing room, with its view into the private garden, fountain, aviary and garden laboratory, out into the great garden with its cypress hedges, parterre of box and flowers, mount and sundial, along the raised terrace flanked with holly and berberous hedges, down the long promenade of 526 feet from the house to the moated island, the measurement which does most to give us a feel for the size of the garden, into the grove with its standard trees of oak, ash, elm, beech and chestnut, and its thickets of hazel, birch and thorn, and cabinets of aliternus, with a great French walnut in each one. And beyond them the great orchard, then into the working areas of the kitchen garden and nursery, since any gardener with such a large area to plant and a limited income must raise as many plants as possible of his own. Even the humblest outbuilding and the dung pit had their places in the plan. What picture could convey so much? We know, because the cartouche says so, that the plan was the work of Evelyn himself except for the calligraphically written key, which was probably copied out by a young man he employed as his amanuensis at this time, called Richard Hoare. In fact, the plan <coughs> key appeared to have been intended as the basis for an engraving. Shortly after he first came to Say's Court in 1652, Evelyn wrote to his father-in-law, Sir Richard Brown, in Paris, of his oval garden, the exact design whereof, together with our other environs, I purpose to send you, copied exactly from the plot which I have now finished, and which is the guide of all our designs. This sounds very much like a description of the plan as we have it. And Evelyn must have sent it the following year, since in January 1654 he writes, I am exceedingly rejoiced to find that my little designs here have pleased you, and adds that he will engrave Sir Richard's appreciative verses on a plate. We know from Anthony Griffith's expert researchers that Evelyn was one of a number of gentlemen amateur printmakers at this period, but no engraving of the Say's Court plan is known. So when we find a plot of Say's Court garden listed in one of Mrs Evelyn's careful household inventories, as hanging in the passageway which ran from the staircase to Evelyn's dressing room, it is probably the very manuscript plan that has now come down to us in his archive. In the Evelyn archive, as it is now arranged at the British Library, there is a second plan of the southwest corner of the garden, the area shown on the 1653 plan as occupied by the parterre and part of the orchard. This plan is entirely in Evelyn's own hand and records the garden as he altered it as a result of the damage caused by the severe winter of 1683-4. The main component of the new design is a hemispherical bowling green with the quadrants or triangular grounds on either side planted with fruit trees. When the Evelyn archive arrived at the British Library and I first saw this document, it was in a folder of plans and drawings of Evelyn's ancestral home at Wootton, but I felt as soon as I saw it that it didn't belong there. Although it had nothing explicit on it to connect it with Say's Court, I was strongly reminded of something I had seen in connection with the Deptford Garden, and these were the professional surveys of the manor of Say's Court 
by Joel Gascoigne and John Grove, at the very end of Evelyn's tenure there. These had been at the British Library for many years as part of the King's topographical collection, and were therefore well known, but they showed a very different garden layout from the 1653 plan, and there had been no indication hitherto of how or when the change had come about. I compared the plan in the Wooten folder with all of these documents and realised from features common to all of them that this was the missing link. It isn't, of course, surprising that a gardener who was so active and so sensitive to changing fashions and climate as Evelyn should have altered his garden layout in the course of 40 years. But until the whole of his archive was available for study, we had only these snapshots, as it were, of the garden at the beginning and towards the end of its life, and couldn't fully investigate what other evidence there might be of the stages of its development. I will now try to indicate briefly what this evidence is. The Evelyn family archive was acquired by the British Library in 1995 from his descendants. It's very large, more than 500 volumes of manuscripts, a volume being either an actual manuscript codex or a volume artificially made by guarding and binding individual documents for safekeeping and many vellum deeds, the majority leases relating to the Sace Court estate. It covers all the generations of Evelyn's branch of his family from the 16th to the 19th centuries, and most importantly for Sace Court, it includes the archive of his wife's family, who had long connections with the dockyard and the royal household at Greenwich, and whose ancestral estate Sace Court was. Evelyn's portion of the archive amounts to somewhere between a quarter and a third of the whole. He was, of course, one of the great record keepers of his day. There is not just the famous diary, actually for the most part a memoir written up in retrospect, of which the original manuscripts remain in the archive. There are also two densely written folio volumes of his letter books, by no means a complete record of the letters he wrote, long series of commonplace books, devotional manuscripts, library catalogues, account books and estate records, as well as the manuscripts in various stages of completion of works he intended for private circulation or actual print publication. His garden at Says Court in Deptford was arguably Evelyn's greatest and most creative achievement, so perhaps it's surprising that he kept no formal record of its development. But the references in the famous diary give us the main milestones. January 1653, I began to set out the oval garden at Says Court, which was before a rude orchard and all the rest one entire field of a hundred acres without any hedge. And this was the beginning of all the succeeding gardens, walks, groves, enclosures and plantations there. February 1653, I planted the orchard at Says Court. New moon, wind west. Spring 1664, I planted the home field and west field about Says Court with elms. December 1664, I planted the lower grove next the pond. And moving on, most sadly in February 1684, I went to Says Court to see how the rigorous weather had dealt with my garden where I found many of the greens and rare plants utterly destroyed. These diary entries can be supplemented from one of the commonplace books entitled A Book of Promiscuous Notes and Observations Concerning Husbandry, in which Evelyn noted, for, the, for example, that he planted the hithermost grove at Says Court. That is the one nearest the house, about 1656, the other beyond it, that is to the west, in 1660 and the lower grove in 1662. But the important point to note is that within 10 years, Says Court had three groves, not just one shown in the 1653 plan. In these commonplace notes, Evelyn also records one of the few horticultural benefits of the dockyard's otherwise oppressive presence. That in 1679, the Moat Island was raised by more than a foot in height and made exceedingly fruitful by the dredging of the wet dock next door. 
In addition to the more formal records of the garden, there are some very informative loose items in the archive, including the original contract with the Greenwich gardener Matthew Blissett for the supply of trees for the orchard in 1653, and a detailed list of 61 evergreens and other rare plants in cases and pots. To flesh out these records, we have Evelyn's letters, particularly those to his father-in-law, the more valuable because they are originals rather than the letterbook copies, which Evelyn sometimes elaborated and misdated in transcription. He was concerned to explain his designs to Sir Richard Brown because Say's Court had been his property, and part of it still was, and because in the 1650s Brown was debarred as a royalist in exile from seeing it himself. He warmly approved of his son-in-law's plans, though he did comment rather unhelpfully after Evelyn had begun his expensive alterations to the old house on its awkward site close to the dockyard wall. I remember my father's fancy was always to place the dwelling house at the other end of the mount, so to enjoy the free prospect of the river and pleasure of the ships, and to have made the coming to it where the summer house now stands, and so either to have disposed of the old mansion into a tenement, or contrived it into offices. In retrospect, Evelyn was inclined to agree that this would have been a good idea, especially looking back on what his piecemeal alterations to the old house had cost him. But at the time, his argument was the characteristic one of the tree lover, that to recite the house would have meant parting with the old elm trees around it, which could never have done well, leaving the new house so naked and defenceless in a place so low and empty of variety as it is without them. Brown's suggestion would, of course, have altered the alignment and symmetry of the garden, and its atmosphere as well, by focusing it outwards on the riverscape. Evelyn's focus was always on the garden for its own sake, and he relied on his increasing skill as a designer and plantsman to make the most of a difficult site. Above all, he was determined to avoid what he called those painted and formal projections of our cockney gardens and plots, which appear like gardens of pasteboard and march pane, and which smell more of paint than of flowers and verdure. Verdure, or greenery, was always to be his greatest delight in gardening, and what in the end he made Sace Court famous for. What emerges most clearly from Evelyn's letters right from the beginning is to his delight in his planting. And in this Sir Richard Brown could be of real help to him in sending nursery catalogues and seeds from Paris. In September 1652, Evelyn wrote, I am transplanting my glorious nursery of near 800 plants, that is Aliternus plants, two foot high and as fair as ever I saw any in France about our court and as far as they will reach at a foot distance in our oval garden. And in 1656 he wrote again of his favourite Aliternus, I have thousands and yet desire more seed, for I intend to plant all that grove with them and other evergreens, which is near an acre of ground. Some pines and firs I have raised, but it is most difficult to procure the several sorts of seed you mention. I have ordinary laurel, but none of the rest, I have pyracanthus, juniper, jasmine, myrtles, rosemaries, yew, box and cypress, but few or none of the rest of the catalogue. Such of them as may be conveyed in seeds I would give any price for, and what other Monsieur Morin shall think, think proper for our climate. In 1658 he was able to report, My grove is yet a dwarf, pine, fir and laurel do best, but all the rest is now infinitely sweet and beautiful. Pierre Morin was the Paris nurseryman whose garden was close to Sir Richard Brown's house in Paris, and it has been recreated for us by Prudence Leith Ross in her article in Garden History in 1993. Morin's specialties were evergreens, and especially the Aliternus, which he had introduced from Provence, and dazzling varieties of tulip, iris, ranunculi, and anemones. His nursery garden was designed as a showcase for these. Within a framework of meticulously kept aliternus and cypress were box-edged beds radiating out like the petals of a flower. 
Evelyn, who had known the garden well in Paris, now took it as the model for his own parterre at Say's court. His version established quickly, and he was soon telling Brown that it was finer than its original. But within a few years, it began to seem less satisfactory to him. Fit chiefly to give pleasure to his wife, while his own greater, slower and more durable designs were brought to fruition. The planting of trees and groves, he said, would present a prospect of a noble and masculine majesty far surpassing those trifling banks and busy knots. However, the growth of the first Says Court grove, as originally planted with native deciduous trees, was soon proving too slow and majestic even for Evelyn. And thus began the extension of the groves noted in the commonplace book of husbandry. Mary Evelyn, whose letter books are also in the archive, in modest quarto notebooks that contrast with her husband's leather-bound folios, had her own say about this. The grove is now changed from a summer shade to evergreen, she wrote to a friend in 1663, so helping us to date this important change in the garden. The tall trees are removed, the cypress hedge on the mount is gone, and there is quite a new face of things. By which, she added, with her characteristic mild irony, I observe that there is no end of improvement, and the various fancies of men have the reward of praise, when poor women are condemned for altering their dress, and for that esteemed vain creatures. The whole process evidently took several seasons, and Sir Richard Brown, by this time at Oxford with the court during the plague winter of 1665, was again pressed into service to procure any curiosity he could beg or purchase from the botanic garden at Oxford, for the Viridaria, as Evelyn called his new evergreen grove. For, as he explained to Sir Richard, I design a range of exotic trees and shrubs, beside the correspondent evergreens to suit them in the old grove. By 1673, he was writing to a female friend that he had given up flower gardening altogether as being too dependent on the seasons and was devoting himself to the cultivation of trees and evergreens. We've grown very accustomed to evergreens, so it's perhaps hard for us to appreciate their impact when they were first introduced in quantity and variety into English gardens. Those who lived amongst them, Evelyn put it rapturously, shall seem to be placed in one of the summer islands and enjoy a perpetual spring, when all the rest of the country is bare and naked. To a devout man like Evelyn, they were also a spiritual emblem, the most natural hieroglyphics of our future resurrection and immortality, and a reminder of the perpetual spring of the Garden of Eden. For these reasons he came to regard them as what he called the most sweet and incomparable part of the Hortelan amenity, more durable and rewarding than flower gardening. In due course the holly hedge, Say's Court's most iconic, native and ancestral evergreen, there had been a holly hedge at by the mount when he first arrived, grew longer with the extension of the groves westward until it was over a hundred yards long and his greatest pride the most glorious and refreshing object of its kind that could be seen, he wrote, glittering with its armed and varnished leaves. But let's remind ourselves of the main reason we don't want Say's Court Garden to be altogether lost. It's because its creator was one of our most attractive and influential writers on gardens and landscape. So how do we document not just the stages of the garden's design and the specifics of planting, but what lay behind them, and in doing so account for the impact the garden made on its many visitors, despite its almost willful embracing of the disadvantages of its site. Here, a letter from Lord Galloway to Sir Richard Brown in Paris, after a visit to the Evelyns at Say's Court in the summer of 1659, is very helpful. In it, Lord Galloway writes enthusiastically of the house, the gardens and walks of her rich closet, his library, and also curiously perfect that it did show the model of what is more largely to be published in theory, which is near perfected. Only his laboratory is laid waste, as having by his translation been more taken up with Epicurean than Hermetical philosophy. 
By this he means that Evelyn's project for the translation of Lucretius de Rerum Natura had taken his time away from the hermetical philosophy of chemical experimentation. The first thing to note in Lord Galloway's description is that the house, the garden, the collection of curiosities, the library and the laboratory were all conceived as intrinsic parts of a total intellectual project. And this immediately points us to a specific garden ideal. Francis Bacon, who set the intellectual agenda for Evelyn's generation, included a garden amongst the essential requirements for the study of natural philosophy or science. This kind of garden, he said, should contain not just a collection of plants, but a menagerie of birds, animals and fish, a cabinet of curiosities or private museum, a library and a laboratory for chemical experiment. It would then be a model of universal nature made private, containing all the elements necessary for the study of the natural world. Say's court, within the limits of its size and its owner's means, was evidently contrived at first to be just such a model. It had a library, of which the sequence of catalogues remains in the archive, and the closet of collections over the porch is noted in the 1653 plan. Admittedly, it didn't have a menagerie, but it did have an aviary, a fish pond, and beehives, including a glass-fronted one through which one might make observations of the bees' activities. And it most certainly had a garden laboratory. We can see it on the 1653 garden plan, and Evelyn included sketches of the interior in his manuscript collections of chemical experiments. Although he had studied chemistry in Paris, he was never, unlike his friend Robert Boyle, a true experimental chemist in his own right. The vegetable distillations he produced in his garden laboratory, spirit of roses or violets, were simply pleasant applications of its procedures for a gentleman gardener. Probably, as Lord Galloway's comment suggests, his use of the laboratory even for these lapsed fairly quickly, giving place to more congenial literary projects. But still, the laboratory, with its impressive 20-foot portico in the private garden, retained an important iconic significance. Say's Court, visitors also noted, was set about with mottos. They were clearly very much part of the charm and distinction of the place, inviting reflection and linking each aspect of the house and garden to a classical ideal. So one of the nicest discoveries in the archive was Evelyn's own lists of these, one of them devoted entirely to the garden laboratory, and showing that over its outer door was inscribed the word purgatorium. Another of the manuscripts in the archive, the translation of a French alchemical treatise, has a preface by Evelyn with a description of just such a garden laboratory, which explains the significance of this inscription. To enter paradise, the great garden which lies beyond, the chemist tells his visitor. He must first pass through a kind of purgatory, the purifying fire of the chemist's furnaces. It was a conceit typically appealing to Evelyn, notable lay Anglican though he was. The second point to notice about Lord Galloway's description of Say's Court in 1659 was that Evelyn presented his garden explicitly as a practical model of what he was preparing to publish in theory. And this, of course, was a reference to his famous gardening compendium, the Elysium Britannicum. The much fragmented original manuscript of the Elysium Britannicum is one of the most important items in Evelyn's archive. We know from the prospectus Evelyn published that the first section was to cover such basic matters as climate, soil and garden tools, the second, every kind of garden feature, from paths and fencing to parterres, groves, water features and every variety of garden ornament, as well as specialist kinds of gardening, such as the cultivation of evergreens, orchards, vineyards and orangeries, while the third and most fragmented final section was to include such Baconian refinements as the gardener's laboratory and library. The Elysium Britannicum was famously never finished, though Evelyn's contemporaries, as soon as they learnt he was working on it, pestered and besought him to do so. 
One reason for its not being finished, as Evelyn freely admitted, was that he was trying to be too all-inclusive. But I think a more basic one is that after the Restoration, both his practical projects and his intellectual preoccupations began to change with the times. Early in the Restoration, the Commissioners of the Navy requested the Royal Society, of which Evelyn was a founder member, to turn its attention to the dwindling supply of timber for shipbuilding. As a response, Evelyn was given the task of drawing on the expertise of his colleagues to compile a manual of advice about the cultivation and use of different varieties of trees. The result was Silver, or a Discourse of Forest Trees, of which the first edition was published in 1664. Silver made Evelyn famous in his own day, and it has scarcely been out of print since. He took it far beyond the original remit, and into edition after enlarged edition, the fourth and final appearing in the year of his death at the age of 85 in 1706. In the process, he transformed the treaties into a celebration not just of the usefulness and economic benefit, but also of the beauty and numinousness of trees. Having covered the principal English natives, he expanded and included what he had written in the Elysium Britannicum and was experimenting with at Say's Court on the cultivation of evergreens and ornamental exotics. And he also lifted the whole of his Calendarium Hortense, describing the gardener's monthly round of tasks, from the second section of the Elysium and added it to Silver as a self-contained appendix. In fact, Silva now replaced the unfinished Elysium Britannicum as the theory of which Say's Court Garden was the practical showcase. For this reason, Silva is an important document for anyone who wants to understand Say's Court Garden in its maturity. As a kind of appendix to the main work, Evelyn sent a detailed report to the Royal Society on the impact of the severe winter of 1683-4 on the specimens in his garden so enabling us to see how closely the garden and the treaty silver were related. Of the native deciduous trees, in his letter to the Royal Society, he lists oak and elm, now of 25 or 30 years standing, and therefore those that he must have planted in the 1650s, lime, walnut, ash, beech, hornbeam, birch and chestnut. And of the native evergreens in his garden, holly, yew, box and juniper, and of the exotics, cork trees, horse chestnut, cedar, ilex, scarlet oak, arbutus, scotch fir, spruce, pine, laurel, rosemary, firs, cypress, savine, acacia, acanthus, pomegranate, laurestinus, filaria, jasmine, myrtle, orange, oleander and mulberry and this makes up almost the entire contents list for silver. In the 1670s, Francis North Lord Guildford, Charles II's Lord Keeper, described by Evelyn as a most knowing, learned and ingenious gentleman, was invited to Say's Court to share a philosophical meal. This was his impression of it, as recorded by his brother Roger. The house was low, but elegantly set off with ornaments and quaint mottoes at most turns. But above all, his garden was most exquisite, being most bosqueresque and, as it were, an exemplar of his book of forest trees. They appeared all so thriving and clean that in so much variety no one could be satiated in viewing, and to these were added plenty of ingenious discourses that made the time short. An account of notable London gardens of the early 1690s, written shortly before Evelyn departed Say's Court for good to return to his native Wootton, notes, Mr Evelyn has a pleasant villa at Deptford, a fine garden for walks and hedges, especially his holly one, of which he writes in his silver. He has four large round filarias, smooth clipped. Part of his garden is very shady for walking. And again we have this confirmation of the impact Say's Court made on visitors, the combination of walks, hedges and evergreens, with the mention of the famous silver. 
we can turn back to the Elysium Britannicum for the importance even attached to garden walks. His chapter of detailed instructions for compacting the surface of them was clearly based on his experience at Say's Court. One of the principal mysteries of the gardener, he adds, is to be able to make and portion them skilfully. As well as great walks symmetrically placed, there must be walks to all the garden features, every one of which, to the smallest alley, should have universal intercommunication. There being nothing more preposterous than to necessitate a returning by the same steps, which many times compels encountering some companies and persons that would otherwise avoid it and be private. As the descriptions I've just quoted suggest, one great appeal of Say's Court Garden was the expertise and meticulousness with which it was kept up. In this respect, another important document for the mature Say's Court Garden, of which the manuscript is in the archive, though it has long since been published, is Evelyn's Directions for the Gardener at Say's Court of 1687. Here, the instructions for the weekly rolling and mowing cycle enable us almost to walk through the garden, the grass plats and gravel of the front courtyard, the upper and lower terrace grass walks, the grass of the greenhouse and fountain gardens close to the house, the gravel walk by the holly hedge, and the grass and gravel walks of the groves, the long middle grass walk to the island, the three grass crosswalks from the orchard to the island moat, the hemisphere of the bowling green, and so back again to the courtyard, with the weeder following close behind to clean the paths and borders. So here we have the mature Say's Court garden, a garden of trees, hedges, evergreens and exotics, lovingly and meticulously cultivated and kept up, contrived for private walking and reflection, and also for good talk and tactful sociability. By bringing in silver one last time, we can even recapture what must have been a major ingredient in the visitor's pleasure in the garden, the way Evelyn himself talked about it all, with an empathy that made the plants almost part of the human company. From the seedlings in the nursery, which showed, Evelyn said, how a tiny grain, which lately a single ant could have easily borne into his little cavern, with its insensible rudiment, or rather habituous spirit, could ascend by little and little into a hard and erect stem of comely dimensions. To the exotics in the greenhouse, which if they should unfortunately happen to be damaged by frost, were not to be despaired of, but to be trimmed with fresh mould, and plunged in a warm bed, carefully refreshed, shaded, aired, and treated like sick patients until they recovered and the elms with which he had planted out his boundaries. A tree of consort, he calls them affectionately, sociable and so affecting to grow in company that the very best I have ever seen do almost touch one another. Quite soon after Evelyn left Say's Court, as we know, the town and the dockyard began to engulf the garden. But it would be a sad failure if we cannot preserve some remembrance of a place of such horticultural distinction, the showcase of one of our most influential works on trees and landscape in the place it was created. <laughs>